In this lecture, I approach the paradoxical nature of Nietzsche's philosophy and the idea of an attempt to bring it to stability by way of abstraction. I will argue that Nietzsche's distinction between the Apollonian and Dionysian is a distinction between active and passive, and it leaves one's attempt to provide an account of reality spiraling in circles as the philosophy of the active Apollonian mode of thought is immediately undone by the passive Dionysian mode. Sartre's attempt to abstract from and stabilize the contradictory structure of man and existence cannot be successful because the problematic dichotomy recurs on any level of abstraction, there is no meta level on which it can be stabilized because of our very real existence in the world. Accordingly, Sartre's ontology, like any other form giving active philosophy, fails to account for the very real Dionysian aspect of existence. Abstracting from Sartre, however, leaves the philosopher in a loop of abstraction in which no progress can be made as the Dionysian reality overtakes the Apollonian form giving philosopher. The Apollonian and Dionysian approaches to the world can be properly seen as a dichotomy between an active and passive approach to the world or, as verbs rather than adjectives, as a split between doing and being. We are the artists of reality in the Apollonian mode, always looking outward to the world and giving it form. With Apollo, both the soothsaying god and the god of form, the Apollonian is always looking forward towards the future with purpose and intention. With these aims in mind, the Apollonian looks towards the higher truth, moving upward towards the light. In order to assess the higher truths of the world, the Apollonian is always assessing his own place in existence, seeing where he stands and where he should go. For this reason, the Apollonian can be identified with an active way of going about living, he approaches the world actively regardless of whether his tasks are usually considered particularly active or not. In Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, Vladimir has an active Apollonian approach to existence even though it does not seem like he does anything active at all. For Vladimir, the world is to be taken as something through which we make progress and accomplish things, life is something to be done, even if the only thing that is to be done is waiting. Opposed to the lofty purpose of action associated with dreaming is the Dionysian approach, epitomized by the metaphor of intoxication. In the ritualistic madness of the Dionysian, the shattering of the principle of individuation eradicates any active thought on who I am or what I ought to do. In this, my self-conception as a self-conscious doer disintegrates as everything subjective vanishes into complete self-forgetfulness. In this intoxication and forgetting of self, the slave is free, a result of stripping of individuation, a stripping of one's role and purpose in the world. Instead of walking, with the purpose of moving oneself towards a goal in the world, the Dionysian dances, letting the rhythm of the world move him. Thus, the Dionysian exists purely as a passive state of being. The Dionysian may seem active in the fact that he acts on intoxicated impulses, but his approach to the world passive in the sense that he does not actively seek what his actions ought to be. If we return to Beckett's play, we find this dragon repeatedly in a passive-minded Dionysian approach to the world. He repeatedly loses conception of goals or tasks, ready to leave the spot where he is to wait for Godot, until, of course, he is reminded of the task of waiting by Vladimir and returns, at least momentarily, to an active mindset. The Apollonian and Genesian approaches to the world have their respective and radically different notions of reality which correspond to whether one is giving form to the world or immersed in it. Apollonian reality contains form and individuation, divisions and classifications among things. The Dionysian world has no separation as this principle is shattered. Nietzsche describes a primordial oneness of nature, a unity between all things, free of form and individuation, revealed in the thrill of intoxication of the Dionysian mode. In his description of the two modes of existence, Nietzsche maintains that the Dionysian world is more real, as the sense that it is only appearance glimmers through the Apollonian world. When we conceive of the dichotomy of active and passive as one between doing and being, it is clear where the distinction of Apollonian existence as mere appearance comes into play. To approach the world actively is to stand outside of it, and appropriate it and see where one stands. Insofar as one is actively approaching the world, he is working with a model of reality which he forms rather than being immersed in reality itself. 
On the other side, when one passively lets the world come on to him, he is no longer a creator of form, assigning order to the world, and standing outside of it. Rather, he is now included in the painting of existence and not involved in the active process of being the artist and maintaining the form of the piece. In this, he is no longer an artist, he has become a work of art. He is entirely in the world, and the notion of imposing form or explanation on the world is unthinkable. Nietzsche attempts to explain the Dionysian notion of a lack of dualities in the world in his discussion of cause and effect, one of the most significant dualities in our world which he takes to be false. However, the tension between Apollonian and Dionysian modes ultimately underwrites this project. To illustrate Nietzsche's point that there are no real causes and effects, only descriptions of the world in terms of them, suppose our world is seen through a window and a train moves by us in such a way that we do not see the whole length of the train at any given moment. We would see the engine pass first, and the caboose would always follow. This may bring us to the explanatory conclusion that the engine causes the caboose. In our limited perspective, we isolate certain objects and events, and the world is given form. But this explanatory form is illusory in the case of a train. It is clear that the engine does not really cause the caboose, it is simply the case that there is a full train moving past a limited perspective. Saying that the engine causes the caboose is not an explanation, but rather a description from a particular perspective. Nietzsche maintains that every causal explanation ultimately is one of this content, a description rather than a true explanation. Nietzsche insists that in our very act of explaining, we operate with things that simply don't exist, with lines, planes, bodies, atoms, divisible times, divisible spaces. If we existed on the highest level of description such that we could see, cause and effect as a continuum, not with our sort of arbitrary division and fragmentation, every causal explanation would be like the example of the train. Nothing in this level of description would be an active doer, because without individuated things going about the world, nothing does or causes anything in the world, the world just is. Accordingly, this stripping of causality is a stripping of the Apollonian notion of actively doing altogether. It is at times of pure Dionysian influence that we exist in this wordness, this lack of isolated form and causality, we see the whole train as a unity, rather than an ordered multiplicity. However, while Nietzsche asserts this truth of reality and denies the existence of lines, planes, bodies, atoms, divisible times, divisible spaces, he continues to operate using these concepts, and more than this, he denies their existence using them. The contradiction arises at the very notion of attempting explanation, even explaining the unreality of them. As this contradiction occurs, Nietzsche shows us one's tendency to be caught precariously in flux between the Apollonian and Dionysian when making an effort to deal with a dichotomy. In attempting to explain the Dionysian oneness of reality, Nietzsche is unable to shake the affective reality of the Apollonian illusion. He tries to describe a state of pure being, but this is impossible without imposing form in the process, and thus Nietzsche ends up at the other end of the dichotomy which he intended to explain. The Dionysian unlearns speaking, for it is impossible to truly convey anything about this way of existence with words, as they require the world to be split into categories to make reference can do nothing to alter or classify this mode of existence, he can only exist in it. This oneness will be missed by anyone who tries to describe it and give it form, for anyone who is truly in the Dionysian mode of reality will make no attempts to describe what is happening, he is too immersed in reality for that. A related situation is described of the realist who looks at the world through his Apollonian filter of appearance and human contribution in describing the world entirely in this way. In this, he is in the thought of pure doing, failing to realize that he is as well. The Dionysian world sneaks up from underneath the Apollonian project. Caught in his explanation, he never escapes his pure Dionysian being behind all of it, and incorporated in his active sobriety is a secret and indelible drunkenness. This is the largest problem for the Apollonian philosopher, which I will label Dionysian overflow, in which the brute reality of existence, particularly one's own existence, 
by necessity escapes one's Apollonian conceptual system, leaving it unable to get to brute reality. On the one hand, we cannot explain Dionysian existence, for every time we are immersed in Dionysian existence, we are not in a position to explain it. But on the other hand, if we explain everything in terms of the Apollonian mode, there is always Dionysian overflow. These contradictions led to the Nietzsche's conclusion, for us, there is no reality, and not few either you sober ones. Nietzsche has abstracted from his contradiction and jumped to a meta level, but this conclusion is yet another paradox of sorts. Is it our reality that there is no reality? This is a paradox parallel to a phrase such as, it is true that there is no truth. Our effective reality may be an illusion, but it is one which we cannot escape insofar as we are actively going about the world. We want a world in itself, but in our attempts to move towards it, all we can ever get is a world with human contribution, a world modified by our action through it. The dichotomy between active and passive leaves us in paradoxes every time we try to come to an understanding of it and its implications on reality.